<laughs> is anybody stuck in the lobby, Maro? Does everybody look like they're back? Uh, let me see. I think everything is here. Yes. Oh, there are many people. So let me see who's next. Um, next is you. Yes. Are you nervous? No, I'm okay. Fantastic. I wish I had a more interesting subject, obviously. You'll make it very interesting. Look into my eyes, not along the <laughs> <laughs> what have you learned from your book then fantastic i've learned uh, it's one minute okay i've learned that hypnosis is not uh, what uh, they they say you don't do silly things during hyp hypnosis you can only hypnotize yourself the hypnotist only helps you in your achievement uh -huh. and if you are in coma due to hypnosis they it, it doesn't mean that if they ask you to kill someone you will go and kill someone if it is against your values, you will wake up and you will tell off the the, the hypnotherapist. So could you maybe, is it sort of use medical uses like to get someone on an MRI scanner and stuff? I, I can, have they I, ever looked into it? Uh, it's, yes, they have. They have. And it fails? Well, no, no huh? it works. It works very well. It depends by your ability to hypnotize yourself. Good morning, everyone. Okay. <laughs> now you can record if you want, Mauro. I, I'm already recording, so there is. Oh, you've recorded the hypnosis. Okay. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, the best in this occasion: MSK pathway and hypnosis. All right. <laughs> okay. Welcome back, everyone. We better start with uh, some we, uh, who will give you a very important presentation. So open your ears because it's very important. Ermer training. This is vital. Uh, uh, for for your uh, uh, for your activity, and you will understand even more why when Paul Morgan <coughs> after that will scare you off a little bit. <laughs> uh, so Sam, the podium is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, hi everybody. Um, my name is Sam Bridgemount. Um, I, a little bit about me. I manage the plane film service at NUH, and I'm also um, the Irma coordinator. Uh, so responsible for the training of staff in uh, the IRMA regulations. Um, a small apology that um, it's this goes very back to basics, but the training is the this is training is the minimum required for all referrers at NUH, and is based around the stated requirements in the IRMA regulations. Um, so here we go. Um, just a brief overview. Um, this training will allow you to refer for limited imaging at NUH. That hasn't been completely decided yet, but I will be communicating with everybody very soon with uh, uh, a new document. Um, this training is very basic radiation physics, um, some basic principles of uh, radiation protection and a brief overview of the law, um, principles of ionizing radiation. Um, Radiation is a term used to describe the transport of energy from one location to another. Some examples of that sound, uh, magnetic light and uh, radiation, the one we use. Um, so energy is carried by the radiation and rel is related to how often the wave repeats itself. So if you have a long wave, you have low energy. And if you have a short wave, you have a high energy. So I don't know if you remember this from school. I do. So here's your electromagnetic spectrum. Um, the ones we are interested are on the left hand side. Uh, these are the ones that are potentially harmful, but also uh, potentially beneficial in um, diagnosing. Um, some um, information about background radiation now. So it's all around us. Um, so it's in the food we eat, for example, Brazil nuts, bananas, potatoes, red meat, carrots, beer and water. So if you eat um, Brazil nuts, if you eat 100 grams, you're going to get 0 0.01 millisiever of radiation. Um, so in uh, obviously air travel, the closer to the sun, the more radiation you get. So a transatlantic flight equals um, 0 0.08 milligrams of, um, not milligrams, uh, millisieverts. Um, in the ground where we live, so um, so in granite rock. Um, so if you live in somewhere like Cornwall, um, you get a, there's a higher level of uranium. So your annual dose is three times the UK um, average. 
and um, if you live in a place called Ramsar in Iran, um, uh, your background radiation is 250 times um, um, the average um, background radiation in this country. So as you can see on there, your average one is 2.7 millisieverts. So I advise you to look up uh, Ramsar in Iran. There's lots and lots of papers about the people that live there and it's uh, very interesting. So here's some examples of um, the imaging that we will be giving on your patients and how much uh, dose is it equivalent to. So if you have your teeth x-rayed at the dentist, it's equivalent to 1.5 days. Um, the things that we're going to provide for you, like pelvises and spines, so you've got 10 days and two months, uh, or uh, lumbar spines, obviously, because it's a thicker area, two to three months. Um, and obviously, um, a CT chest abdo pelvis is up to seven years worth. So obviously, the frequent flyers that we get on a regular um, occasions in ED um, um, are going to be uh, glowing by the time they're finished. Um, the next slide, um, this show shows a few of the more dramatic effects of radiation on humans. So um, as I say, it's very basic here, um, some genetic effects, DNA damage, et cetera, cancer, infertility, and so on. Um, we, as radiographers base, um, how we position on patients to minimize um, the doses we, we give to patients. So for example, um, we want to avoid areas like the thyroid gland, eyes, lungs, bone marrow, and reproductive organs. So where possible, we petition the patient so they're facing away from the x-ray tube. So we would do um, a chest x-ray in a, in a PA position and things like facial bones, etc. So here's a, just a slide to show the, some of the risks of the radiation um, examinations. So you've got chest x-ray um, of the risk of one in 900,000 of um, um, giving them a fatal cancer uh, compared to a coronary angioplasty, which is one in a, uh, 1,300. Some more on basic principles of radiation protection. Um, so obviously you are all aware that uh, radiation can increase the chance of getting a cancer. So uh, we need to make sure that the imaging must be justified and this is, must be done by trained individuals. Um, protection and safety should be optimised at all times. Um, it's done in many ways, uh, positioning of the patient, buying new um, newer kit, um, ensuring that the lower dose, um, that the, the equipment is optimised. Um, we have well-trained staff, including um, um, any referrers. And then dose should not exceed specific dose limits. The UK government has produced national dose reference levels, um, and then NUH has produces local versions of these. Um, we compare one with the other, and if lo uh, our local um, diagnostic reference levels exceed those set by the government, the department would consider uh, replacing the kit. So I'm afraid this is just a slide that you need to read. Um, the use of radi ionizing radiation for medical purposes is regulated by law. All healthcare professionals whose work involved the use of ionizing radiation are required by law to be familiar with the relevant regulations. And these are the, um, were bought, uh, changed and brought out again in 2017. Um, so what does IRMA stand for? It stands for the Ionising Radiation Medical Exposure Regulations. Um, um, they're, you, these are now European-wide. Um, the compliance for these regulations is inspected by the Care Quality Commission, and this is inclusive of the training of referrers. So anything we do today, we would document everything that we've taught you So, um, and in case we are asked. So we are... Um, all of your interface providers, please, could you also um, document these things? Um, if we have any radiation incidents, uh, which we do have at NUH, because uh, we're all human and make mistakes, um, these needs, uh, if they're of a high dose, they will be reported to the CQZ. Um, uh, specifically, if we do the wrong patient, it is always reportable. And also if there's dose considerably higher than intended. Um, so we get inspected and, they, and the CQC and HSC have the power to initiate prosecution um, in case of flagrant contravention of regulations. So we want to avoid this. Um, right, the EMA regulations are in place to protect patients and the carers and comforters in the room from receiving exposures from unnecessary or 
for unnecessary or inappropriate reasons. Um, they're to protect patients from receiving excessive radiation dose due to faulty or unsuitable equipment. Um, but it is not concerned to, with the uh, management of the employees and their radiation doses. So it's a uh, part of the health and safety at work that came out in 1974. Um, so who does it apply to? It applies to any and all healthcare professionals whose work may influence a patient's exposure to ionising radiation. So these include uh, yourselves as referrers, um, operators who um, use the um, equipment, anybody who looks at the request to authorise and um, the request. Um, those who provide reports are also considered uh, um, that they need training in these radi radiation uh, protection and anybody who's engaged in equipment maintenance like uh, engineers and medical physics experts. Uh, so the requirement under the law is that all staff be able to identify roles in, a, in any documentation. So hence this is getting to the, the boring bit that um, I'm afraid you'll, you need to know. So um, what is a referrer? A referrer is a registered med, um, healthcare professional that is entitled uh, under the employer's procedures, as in NUH's procedures, to refer individuals for medical exposures to the practitioners. So I will change my, our, our documentation to state that we will accept referrals from external referrers after this is all put in place. So types of um, referrers, obviously, you've got all doctors and dentists, and then there's non-medical referrers. Um, up until this point, we've owned, we've kept this in-house and in the trust. Um, we're now going out into the community. Um, this is going to um, cause some issues with compliance and ensuring that we communicate um, together to um, ensure all our documentation is in place and we can prove that we've trained you. So what is an operator? And operators are responsible for each and every practical aspect of the exposure which they carry out. So the uh, examples, ID check, pregnancy status, um, the quality assurance on the equipment, uh, authorization of a request, etc. Uh, and UH, again, these are all stated in documents rather than made up by the government. Um, they include um, our system practitioners, radiographers, etc, etc, etc. Don't need to read those out. So what is a practitioner? Practitioner means a registered medical or dental practitioner or other health professional that is entitled to justify an individual medical exposure. Um, so um, for examples of these um, at NUH, again, they're very specific to the hospital, is a consultant radiologist and any um, specialist registrars have passed part two of their exams. Uh, we do have a few specific radiographers who have been trained to uh, justify very specific examinations. So um, uh, ED heads, for example. So um, we receive a request and the first thing that happens is someone, a, a practitioner or um, SBR will look at the request. Oh, I forgot to add that um, radiographers can also um, look at requests, but only because um, documentation has been written and so called authorization guidelines, which they follow when they look at requests. Um, so the request goes through two processes. So it's a first of all, it goes through justification. Um, so this is a mental process where, um, say, Marrow would look at it and um, weigh up the potential benefit of the medical exposure against uh, the detriment to the individual. So in other words, he thinks with all his knowledge that he has that this person should have an MRI rather than an ultrasound, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they would always think if there's one that's not involving radiation um, would be better for the patient, so they would consider it. Then authorization, this is it requires documentation and is set checked by the CQC. Is our written or electronic evidence that the process of justification had taken place? Um, uh, so that's just a very simple slide. Again, just reiterate a journey of any request into NUH would be you request it, we justify and authorize it. Um, one of the radiographer presses the button and then at all points there must be a clinical evaluation by a practitioner or operator. So in this trust, most examination, most x-rays are um, 
reported by a radiologist or reporting radiographer, but we deem some other professionals that, that they can they are operators and therefore can report their own images, for example, fracture clinic orthopedics. Uh, again, just to reiterate why you must know about it, um, just about the possibility of giving them a facial cancer and especially the last line in here, for the risk for children uh, is approximately three times greater than the adults due to their rapid cell turnover in growing tissue and their longer life expectancy. Um, so what we would like on a, um, a, ref a referral, so we need uh, at all times we need to be able to read and the patient's full name, the patient's address, current if possible, um, the patient's hospital number and the patient's date of birth. Um, we cry this from now on when this process is set up that this is done electronically this al um, allows us to read all this information because um, if we get written requests etc they're often um, difficult to read it is your uh, legal obligation to ensure this information is correct um, the referral also has a legal obligation to provide relevant clinical information sufficient to allow someone else practitioner to justify the examinations. Some common forms of genetic, uh, generic clinical information pre-op, post-op will always be rejected because we need often a clinical question that we are trying to answer for you. Um, this um, is just about pregnancy. Um, if we're going for a, um, a plain film x-ray, we use a 28-day rule. So we would ask your patients if there's any possibility if they've been pregnant. Again, you don't need to read all this. It's just um, the last sentence um, that we asked the patient immediately prior to the exposure uh, whether there is any chance that she could, the individual could be pregnant. If the patient is confident that she cannot be pregnant, sorry, individual can't be pregnant, they are asked to sign a disclaimer form which is scanned into the patient's records. So if the patient is not confident, we would um, ask the patient to rebook. Um, just wanted to inform you in this case that that would be why we were doing that. Uh, um, so that I've, I've already been through this. This is just about um, uh, always you're using electronically. Only um, um, use your own uh, login, use your own password, and never share it with anybody else. Uh, and then uh, again, this is part of the legal requirements that we, um, us as a trust, um, ensure that every every um, x-ray or imaging is reported because what was the point of doing it if we didn't and just a summary of some do's and don'ts just to help you along do only request x-rays when the outcome will affect your management of the patient if your treatment will be the same regardless of the outcome of the in of the examination there is no point in doing it do check that someone else has not already requested the same examination do provide clinical information on the request. This is a legal requirement. And do consider whether lower dose alternative methods should be used instead. And a couple of don'ts, obviously. Don't ele enter electronic radiology requests on someone else's passport, password. Don't, do not allow someone else to use your password and do not make multiple advance requests. I don't think anybody does that one anymore, but it was very, very common. And then just my last slide, um, again, one of the reasons we, we were obliged to train everybody because we're all human and make mistakes. And this is evidence um, of a CQC report. So nationally, uh, including England and Wales. And as you can see, uh, referral errors um, are, um, uh, come out top um, when radiation incidents are um, investigated. So um, the blue section was referral errors and um, the other one, where's it? Purple one, um, we failed to identify the patients there, sort of the, the two biggest ones. Um, thank you for listening. Sorry, such a dry subject, but it's a responsibility as a trust to ensure that all anybody who refers into the trust um, receives um, um, some training. Do you have any questions? That was not dry. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Any question for uh, Sam? Right. In this case, Paul, are you there? 
Yeah. Good, good morning, everyone. OK, uh, the podium is yours then. Great, so let's uh, start with the usual trying to share my screen. So hopefully you can see a full screen MRI safety slide. Yes. Fantastic. Good. So um, my name is Paul Morgan. Uh, I'm from medical physics at, uh, at NUH. Um, this presentation is going to be a little bit different from some of the others. What I want to do is um, tell you about some of our concerns uh, in the MRI department related to MR safety of the patient referrals that you're going to make. Um, I'm going to split this into two parts. Most of it's going to be about the background as to why we are extremely concerned about uh, uh, MR patient safety uh, and then finish with what we'd really like you to do to help us and make sure that we can scan patients safely but also not turn patients away unnecessarily. Uh, okay so as a recap, uh, magnetism we know mainly from the Earth's magnetic field. Um, the thing with magnetism is it's a force at a distance so we know that the uh, core of the Earth is the, mag is the magnet but the force extends uh, above the Earth and it's strong enough to twist a, a compass needle uh, and point to the uh, North Pole of the, of the Earth. So it's a, a force at a distance. Uh, we're normally aware of magnets like this, this uh, horseshoe magnet. Um, there's three different types of magnetic materials. I'm just going to remind you quickly of what they are. The one we're mainly concerned about with MR safety is ferromagnetic materials. So these are materials that become strongly magnet magnetized and once they're magnetized they stay magnetized. And these are things like iron, nickel and cobalt. So you may say, well, I, my patients don't have iron implants in them, um, but of course iron is part of stainless steel. Uh, so stainless steel we consider to be ferromagnetic and therefore strongly magnetic. Uh, just to close the loop, the two other types of materials, one's called paramagnetic, this is weakly magnetic materials, they're slightly attracted to, the, to our MRI scanner, um, and these are things like aluminium. Uh, so if we've got things made out of aluminium, we're not so concerned about their magnetic uh, forces compared to stainless steel. And then diamagnetic materials are also weakly magnetic, and these are things like water, plastics, copper, gold and silver. Uh, so again, we don't tend to be worried about uh, people's wedding rings, uh, assuming they really are made of gold and silver and, and uh, not something else with paint on. Uh, so it's ferromagnetic materials we're concerned about for MR safety. Uh, so here's a picture of an MR scanner, an old MR scanner. Uh, we can think about hazards associated with the main magnetic field um, and then hazards associated with the radio waves that we put into the patient and the radio wave echoes we detect back to build up our MRI picture. Uh, there are also some uh, hazards directly related to the patient and if you're referring for an injection of contrast agent there are a few things you need to know about that as well. So we turn that into topics. We've got non-biological effects and biological effects. So the main hazard associated with the main magnetic field of the scanner is that the magnet is always on. We never switch it off uh, unless something goes wrong with the scanner. Uh, so this is very different from x-rays that we've just been talked about where the hazards from the x-rays are only present during the, the brief um, milliseconds that you're doing the exposure, but as soon as the x-ray tube is, is, is not emitting x-rays, it's completely fine and safe to go in the, scan, in the uh, x-ray room. That's not the case with MRI. The magnetic field's always on, so the hazards associated with the main magnetic field are there 24 hours a day. Uh, so the main concern is there's something called the projectile effect. So this is when uh, someone uh, goes into the MR scanner room with some ferrous material, so stainless steel, uh, either holding it or as part of an implant inside them, uh, and that becomes magnetized and it becomes attracted to the magnet and as the person or the object goes closer to the scanner the forces become stronger uh, and it can become strong enough to uh, pull the object out of your hand and turn it into a projectile flying into the middle of the scanner which of course is where your patient would also be. Uh, we're also concerned about the main magnetic field interfering with electronics and in particular pacemakers although there are other uh, implants now that are becoming popular that have electronics in as well. And we're also concerned about smaller metallic fragments in soft tissues. Um, so think of things about the size of a compass needle. Uh, if it's in a soft tissue uh, and as the person uh, goes into the scanner, the compass needle effectively twists and turns to align with the uh, scanner's magnetic field and that can cause localised tearing and bleeding. So we're concerned about metal fragments, particularly in the eye and people with aneurysm clips, for example. Um, here are some examples of projectiles. Uh, the image on the left is chair that's been pulled off the floor into the scanner and the image on the right is a floor buffing machine that again has been pulled off the floor just from the strength of the, of the scanner. Uh, so from our point of view you think well that's obvious you don't take these sort of things into a scanner room. Uh, the image on the left could be um, a child that's being scanned, no metal on the child, a uh, child's a bit anxious, uh, can mum go in the scanner room? Uh, yeah that's fine, there's uh, no metal on mum, that's fine. 
Mum says, how long is the scan going to be? Oh, it's going to be about uh, half an hour. Oh, can I have a chair? Sit down on and whoops, accidentally, the chair's gone into the scanner room. And of course, it doesn't look like stainless steel. It looks like plastic, but we know underneath the covers that it's stainless steel. Okay, so we should get a video uh, here. It may take a little while to start. So this is a, a cylinder, and we're very concerned about oxygen cylinders, particularly anaesthetized patients. Uh, this is a 1.5 Tesla scanner, the same magnetic field strength as a lot of the scanners in, in NUH. Uh, and at this distance away from the scanner, gravity is holding uh, the, the uh, cylinder onto the table, but as the person pushes the table closer to the scanner into a stronger magnetic field, the force of the magnetic field is strong enough to attract um, uh, the bottle into the scanner. So it's, uh, it often takes a little while before the video starts. So here's another video uh, saying basically the same thing. Uh, to start with, the person can hold the cylinder uh, with his hand, but even so, the magnetic field attraction is strong enough that it's pulling the cylinder uh, horizontal. Again, this is a 1.5 Tesla scanner. And of course, they're going to do the same thing. So the thing to watch here is how quickly it goes from being uh, gravity holding it onto the bed to it turning into a projectile. This is not something you can say accidentally, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Once this happens, everything happens very quickly and you've um, caused great harm to a patient and of course it's happened. slightly dramatic uh, sound effects there but of course the issue is uh, this is now an ongoing incident the magnetic field is still on it's on all the time uh, so if this cylinder is crushing our patient we can't get it out So unfortunately, around the world, uh, people die every year, one or two people through this, this exact this incident, um, through um, people taking cylinders and other large ferromagnetic objects into the scanner room, which fly into the scanner and, and crush uh, the patient. Um, and I'd also like to, you to reflect this is very different from the uh, X-ray uh, hazards and risks that you've just been described to you. Um, if we get it wrong in MRI, it's a very binary hazard. It's either completely safe or we've killed someone. This is not giving uh, an increased risk of getting cancer in 20 years to our patient from having a repeat chest x-ray exposure. Uh, this is very binary. It's either fine or we've had got a major incident. So, um, and also this is something that happens very quickly. So uh, the radiographers in the MRI department are paranoid about um, ensuring this doesn't happen. Other things can become projectiles. Uh, things in people's pockets, scissors are particularly nasty, they're made of stainless steel and got a sharp point on and they're going to fly into the middle of the scanner. We're concerned about wheelchairs, keys, pages and so on. Now, of course the magnetic fields extend away from the, the scanner itself, um, just like the iron filings going around, um, uh, around a bar magnet. So we exclude people from going too close to the MRI scanner, so the blue line here is the walls of an MRI scanner looking down from above. The red line is where the dangerous magnetic field extends to, so we have to restrict access all the way around our MRI scanner, not just the MRI scanner room itself. Um, the main magnetic field can also interfere with electronics. Uh, historically, people are concerned about the electronics of pacemakers, uh, and it's been shown that even quite low magnetic fields, so 0.5 millitesla, and remember our scanner magnetic field strength is 1.5 tesla or 3 tesla, so thousands of times weaker than the uh, magnetic field strength in the middle of the scanner can start to interfere with the operation of pacemakers and make them malfunction. Uh, we said about small metal fragments, we're concerned about aneurysm clips. For example, the magnetic field is not going to be strong enough to rip this aneurysm clip out and drag it through the brain, but if it twists it like a compass needle trying to align with the scanner's magnetic field, it could rupture the aneurysm clip. We're also concerned about metal in the eyes. This is a shotgun 
uh, pellet uh, or also shards from people who may have worked in uh, welding shops uh, and uh, got metal fragments in their eyes. Uh, so uh, if we're unsure, we would uh, refer the patient for a, an x-ray to check whether they have metal in their eyes or not. Um, now, of course, when you're referring and the patient's in front of you, uh, people will often say, will often be thinking, oh, yeah, I had something in my eye, but it was 30 years ago and it's never caused a problem. It's been fine. You know, we're concerned about that because we know the metal hasn't actually gone away. It hasn't got better. The metal is still there and can still be causing a hazard. Uh, so here's a radiographer's nightmare, someone scanning someone with metal in their eyes. And here's a picture, it's not in Nottingham. This is a picture of uh, someone who went in for an MRI scan, um, did not disclose they had metal in their eye. Uh, they came out of the MRI scan and said, my eyesight's gone a bit funny, it's all gone a bit blurry. And it turned out that the metal fragment has uh, been um, torn this path uh, across through the eye. Uh, so again, we're uh, very paranoid and concerned about this. Uh, this isn't a, a binary, oh well, uh, you know, we're in increasing the percentage risk of cancer across the whole population. This is very much, if we get it wrong, it happens to this patient today. Uh, so things we're not so worried about are fillings. Um, these uh, are all safe. If people can take them out, we would rather they do take them out, but they're safe to go in the MR scanner. Uh, however, they can cause problems with the images. This is a sagittal brain scan, and in particular, you can see this person's mouth and tongue. Uh, and this is a scan, a central scan of someone who's got dentures, and you can see that uh, the dentures has wiped out the signal from around the mouth. Uh, the brain is still uh, visible, but if they had uh, more dental work, um, this bright boundary here and this dark hole could extend up into the frontal lobes and make the scan non-diagnostic. Uh, and of course, uh, going down into the neck, this bright ring here is an artifact from, uh, from fillings, making the scan non-diagnostic. Uh, Things that are screwed into, into bones, uh, the magnetic field is not strong enough to cause, cause a problem, but it can cause uh, an image artifact uh, on, the, on this knee scan here, again, potentially meaning that the scan is uh, undiagnostic. So we want to know about things in, in the patient. Um, other hazards, hazards, uh, hassles, the, magnet, the magnetic field of the scanner will wipe your credit card, it will stop your watch working, it's an analog watch, uh, and it will wipe your parking ticket, swipe cards, it can be quite inconvenient. So it's not a safety issue, but again, these things cannot go into the MR scanner, uh, so the patient would have to leave these in their locker. Okay, the radio waves that we use uh, also have hazards associated with them. Uh, in particular, uh, if we have a wire in the scanner, it can act like an aerial or an antenna, pick up the radio waves, um, which induce alternating current, which warms up the aerial or the antenna. And if it warms it up to maybe 100 degrees Celsius, uh, it can burn anything that's in contact with. Uh, and this actually is the most commonly reported uh, adverse incident um, uh, in both uh, the UK and States. Uh, so the radio office will try and avoid this, but anything that looks like an RF antenna uh, on, uh, will pick up the radio waves of the scanner as well. Um, so here's an example of the scanner running. Oh, we've lost you, Paul. Oh, yeah, Paul, we have lost you a little bit. Is your microphone OK? Uh, so we're concerned about this, very concerned about this. Here are some examples of uh, skin burns uh, from the literature. You can see this is of a, a child here, and it often happens when people are under general anaesthetic and they can't report uh, that they're getting um, uh, they're getting warm. Uh, and unfortunately, we have had an incident uh, in Nottingham many years ago um, that was uh, severe enough that the patient had to have a reconstructive surgery. So this does happen. Um, particularly nasty case from Israel, uh, where a, a baby came down for a scan. Uh, the, as there was a, a, a non-MR compatible. Uh, uh, pulse oximeter uh, under a bandage which wasn't spotted and went after the scan uh, they realized that it was caused a horrendous burn uh, leading to amputation. So again this is very binary if we get it right if this pulse oximeter was an MR compatible one uh, this wouldn't have happened uh, it could look exactly the same as an MR unsafe one um, so it's a very binary we either get it right or we get it horrendously wrong. Uh, so with RF fields, again, back to our pacemaker, we said the main magnetic field can interfere with the pacemaker base, but we're also concerned about the pacing wires, which act, look like an aerial to me, look like an antenna, and these can pick up radio waves and cause a uh, sparking, um, a misfiring part uh, of the tips. Of course, there's not just pacemakers, there are things like Vegas nerve stimulators. From my point of view, this is just like a pacemaker. It's got a basic unit and it's got a wire which can pick up the radio waves and stimulate the nerve um, erroneously. 
deep brain stimulators, again, uh, wires going into very sensitive eloquent parts of the brain. Um, if these pick up the radio waves and start to cause burns at the tip, um, this can be um, extremely uh, dangerous for the patient. And here's an example uh, of an MR scan showing uh, an infarct around the tip of a, a, a DBS wire uh, in a patient from the States. Um, and again, that will be a life-changing um, injury for the patient. Uh, so the radiographers are very good at uh, uh, dealing with ECGs, uh, making sure the wires are away from the skins to, to reduce the, the risk of burns. Uh, so what about tattoos? We're not concerned about tattoos like this, but we do want to know if people have extensive uh, body art. Uh, so these sort of people would not be compatible for an MR scan, uh, even if this person could take all the metal work out, which is probably going to be steel, so ferrous material. Um, there's enough continuous tattoos. This could act like a joined up antenna or aerial uh, and heat up. Uh, but we're more concerned about this sort of body art. It probably wasn't put in in a, in a regulated uh, tattoo parlor. Uh, she probably doesn't know what material was used to put in here. Uh, and often if you want a red color, you could use iron oxide rusty color, um, which of course uh, is a ferrous material. Uh, there are very few cases of uh, burns uh, around uh, tattoos, but here's an example of uh, erythema around a new tattoo. It's very rare and I would pretend, potentially argue that, uh, uh, you know, the diagnostic information outweighs um, a bit of erythema in this case. Uh, so we do want that we do warn patients that uh, they should alert us if their tattoos uh, start to warm up. Uh, and of course, there are more and more tattoos going on in, in places that, that we may not realize. So, you know, people will often, um, you know, use tattoos uh, as permanent makeup as well. So that's not a contraindication for a scan, but we'd like to know about it. Um, the radio waves also depend on uh, the body part that we're imaging. So the lower left, we're imaging someone's head. In the middle, we're imaging someone's chest. And in the lower right, we're imaging someone's knee. Uh, so the risks around radio waves relate to the body part being imaged, not to the entire patient. Um, so what about the main magnetic field effect on humans? So in animals, uh, they've done experiments up to at least 45 Tesla, which is over 10 times our maximum magnetic field strength in clinical scanners. And there's been no permanent effect uh, observed. Uh, there are some temporary effects in humans. Some people feel a little bit nauseous or vertigo, uh, and this is probably to do with magnetizing the water in the balance uh, areas of your uh, inner ear. And some people with fillings report metal tastes, but these are temporary effects. So in, if a patient uh, asks you, um, they're concerned about the effects of magnetic fields from when you're referring for an MR scan. There are scientifically, there are no um, interactions from the magnetic field on biological systems. Um, uh, and the limit is up to at least eight Tesla uh, in the States. Uh, and, and again, the highest uh, magnetic field strength in NUH is three Tesla. Uh, there are some issues with claustrophobia. Uh, to make the strong magnetic field, it's got to be uh, the person has to go into a tunnel. Uh, traditionally, they were 60 centimeters in diameter and with a table underneath, the uh, AP direction is, is smaller. Uh, manufacturers try and sell you uh, scanners with pictures like this, whereas often uh, we see um, things that look a little bit more like this. So there can be claustrophobic experience. However, uh, from July onwards, all of the MR scanners in Nottingham will no longer be 60 centimetre internal diameter, but they will be 70 centimetre internal diameter, which means may not sound like much, but it means it's all the way around the bore. So it's a much wider bore scanner and also the table can go lower down. Uh, so we can um, usually accommodate the larger patient as well as the claustrophobic patient. Uh, the scanner is noisy, uh, I'm afraid, and unfortunately to speed up the scanner, uh, the, the downside is the faster the scan, the noisier it is. So um, everyone, patients will uh, wear ear protection, uh, ideally both earplugs and plastic ear defenders. Uh, okay, um, the radio waves can heat up uh, the patient slightly as well. Radio waves are next to microwaves on the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, and other radio waves are far less efficient than microwaves. They can still heat up tissue a little bit. Um, so the, the, scan, the patient can feel a bit warm. Um, However, the scanner is, is limited to make sure that we cannot warm the patient up uh, by more than uh, one degree Celsius. Um, so they may feel a bit warm, but that's that's very well regulated and controlled by the scanners and by international um, committees. Uh, so how do we know if an implant is safe or not to go into the scanner? Uh, MR safe implants should have this labeling attached to them. That's fairly clear. Uh, MR unsafe ones are also fairly clear. They cannot go in the scanner. There's nothing we can do about that. Uh, and there's a category in between called MR conditional. Um, so these are devices uh, that if we follow the conditions, 
uh, then we can scan them in certain cases. If we do not follow the conditions, then we cannot scan them. They would effectively revert to being MR unsafe. If we need to know what the conditions are, we need to know what the implant is. So we need to know from you what the implant is that a particular patient has, what its make is, what its model is, so that the radiographers can look up the conditions and see whether or not we can scan them safely. So here's an example of a recent pacemakers. Uh, these are now MR conditional pacemakers. So under certain conditions, we can scan people with pacemakers. Uh, they will specify the conditional scanner, so we can only use one and a half Tesla fields. Uh, and we'd have to make potentially a separate appointment for them to go to the cardiology uh, for the cardiac tech to switch their uh, pacemaker into MR scan mode and potentially check the pacemaker, check the impedances and so on beforehand and afterwards. Um, so we can't have the patients turning up with uh, what they may be thinking are MR safe pacemakers. This still needs to be flagged up to us in advance so we can actually check the make and model of the pacemaker and check what the specific conditions are because each make and model has different conditions associated with it, so we need to know exactly what it is they've got. We want to know which implants are safe. Uh, a good resource is this free website, mrisafety.com. Um, the radiographers will deal with all, with all of this, but if you're interested, you can have a look. It's got two main sections. One's called the list, and this is if you know specifically what the implant is, what its make and model is, whether it's a Medtronic model 7700, for example. Uh, if you don't know what the make or model is and you want to know about safety information in general, um, there's something called safety information topics that will tell you about what are the MR safety issues about breast tissue expanders and implants, for example, uh, cochlear implants, cardiac pacemakers and so on, and it will give you general advice as to what's going on. So, for example, if someone's got a coronary stent, um, can we scan them? Uh, so first thing is we might be concerned about the main magnetic field pulling them. They're quite small, the forces will be weak, but we still like to know how long they were put in to make sure they're fibrosed into place. We want to know which body parts being imaged. Uh, are we imaging the head and or the chest? Or are we imaging the knee, which is further away from where the, um, the stent will be? Uh, and then we can look up on that mrisafety.com website. We don't know the make and model, so we'll look up coronary artery stents in general, read the blurb, and it says it's fine to scan them. So that's the sort of thought process we go through. There are other concerns with cochlear implants. I'm going to skip through this. Uh, the radiographers are experts at going through the whole range of implants, but we do need to know what it is that uh, the patient has in them to enable them to, to be scanned. And these, a lot of that information is not stuff that can be found uh, in five minutes when the patient turns up just before the scan. Pregnancy, so there's no clear evidence in humans of any adverse effects. Um, However, we will reduce, slow down the scanner for uh, imaging pregnant patients. Uh, however, bear in mind, uh, there's no ionizing radiation involved with uh, MRI. So MRI is still a preferable uh, diagnostic exam compared to X-ray imaging or CT for pregnant patients. Uh, in fact, is, is a great um, scan to be used for looking for fetal abnormalities. Uh, giving contrast agents, MR contrast agents are normally much better tolerated than CT or X-ray contrast agents, uh, but there is a very rare condition nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, NSF, uh, which, which caused this sort of fibrosis on people and it's uh, been linked to MR contrast agents. Uh, and the problem is if uh, a patient's kidneys um, don't clear the contrast agent quickly enough after 48 hours or so, uh, the old contrast agents will start to denature uh, and become toxic in the body. Um, the modern contrast agents are much better than this, but we do uh, want to know if you're referring for a contrast uh, agent exam, the uh, kidney status of the patient. And in particular, if they've got a, a creatinine uh, uh, value, then we can look up the eGFR, uh, remembering that an eGFR of 100 is, is, is normal. Uh, so if it's above 60, there's no issue with giving um, a contrast agent. If it's between 30 or 60, uh, we probably want to consider whether the contrast agent is, is uh, really required. And if it's less than 30, so um, end stage kidney disease, it would be advisable not to have contrast agent. And if they really do need it, uh, then we'd have to take measures uh, to put them for dialysis or have you to try and help clear the contrast agent out of them. Having said that, the manufacturers over the last 10 or 15 years have greatly improved the chemistry of their contrast agents uh, and, and this is now very rare. So how do we deal with this? Uh, we screen the patient, we ask them over and over again, have they got metal in their body? Uh, obviously they've come uh, for their MRI scan, they're worried about what's wrong with them, they may not be thinking um, about answering a questionnaire completely accurately. So we're asking over and over again, have you got an aneurysm clip, have you got a cardiac pacemaker, have you got an ICD, etc., etc. And there are some odd things here that perhaps you may not be aware of. Uh, so there are things like people who've, who've maybe had a stroke or a droopy eyelid may have a, uh, an eyelid spring or a wire to keep their eyelid open. That's probably stainless steel. 
um, some hair extensions uh, and hair weaves can have metal in. Um, some sports clothing now has uh, silver metal strips in, uh, which is supposed to be uh, stop antibacterial. Uh, these can cause skin burns. Uh, there are um, pill cams uh, that certain patients can swallow. These are very uh, dangerous for MR. So if the patient hasn't passed the, the, the pill cam out, that's been taking photos as it's been transiting through them, uh, that, that can cause risks. Um, people may have body piercings that they can't take out. They may have body piercings in, in uh, private places that they, they don't want to tell us about and they lie about it. Uh, so we really do need to sort of quiz the patient. Uh, this is the one that we use in Nottingham. We'll come on to this a bit later. Uh, notice that we're asking, do you have or have you ever had, which means we're concerned about people who may have had heart surgery, uh, they had um, pacing wires put in temporarily. They do not have a pacemaker anymore, but the pacing wires may still be there and they can still act as antenna uh, and heat up. So just to finish, when uh, you're referring, obviously you're thinking about the patient. The patient doesn't know what to expect from the MR scan. They may have been told the wrong information that the scanner is claustrophobic, it's noisy, it's terrible. Uh, they may have seen a TV program, read some stuff on the internet about how awful it is. Um, uh, and this obviously doesn't help someone who may even be a little bit claustrophobia claustrophobic when they come to the scan. Um, however, as I've said from July onwards, all of our scanners uh, in NUH will be the uh, newer wider ball scanners. Uh, they're also shorter and they've got um, the manufacturers have invested in, in lighting to try and make them less claustrophobic. This is one of our scanners at the City Hospital. This is our new scanner uh, at the QMC uh, site as well. And again, it's, it's, it's open, it's spacious. Yes, they still, still have to go into a tunnel, but we've got videos, uh, movies that people can watch uh, and we've, we've done the best we can to try and make it less claustrophobic. Uh, so um, when you're referring, uh, we'll be asking the patient and uh, you can ask the patient uh, if they've got uh, metal fragments in their eyes, uh, anything that you can find that you can put on the referral will be greatly helpful to the radiographers. If they've got a pacemaker or a mechanical heart valve, if you've got the notes in front of them, we don't have the notes uh, in the MRI department, if you do, uh, put as much information of the manufacturer and model on the referral. And again, brain sonia Andrews and clips, you may have that in front of you. We don't have that information. Uh, all sorts of clips, pins, plates, screws, implants. A lot of these may be fine to, to scan, but we still need to know about them. Surgery in the last three months, this is not a contraindication, but it's just starting the conversation with the, the patient as to what they may have in them. And in particular, electronic implants. And again, what's the model? What's the make? Please, if you know, let us know. Uh, so just to finish, uh, please include as much information as possible. You have probably have the notes. We certainly don't and would have to send the patient away while we investigate and rebook them. Uh, if the patient says something like, oh, yes, the surgeon told me the device is MR safe. Uh, that's not good enough for us. We want to still want to know what it is, um, the make and the model. Uh, and as you know, uh, it won't be MR safe. It will be MR conditional. They may say I've had an MRI scan before and it was fine. Uh, are they really sure they know what an MRI scanner is compared to a CT scanner or a PET scanner? Not sure. Uh, they may have had an MR scan before and they may have missed uh, a dangerous implant and they may just have got away with it. And if you're unsure, call the MRI department to discuss. Uh, you don't have to do all this detective work yourself, but start the conversation sooner rather than later so we don't waste the appointment and have to send the patient away. So I'll finish there. Uh, any questions? Well, so I, told, I told, sorry, sorry. Yes, yes, I told, I told you, you it, it would, would uh, scare, uh, scare you off. off. I should I have should said have graphic, graphic content. content. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you Thank you very much. much. And uh, uh, last on the list is Yuri Arlachov, which will uh, uh, tell you about the spinal referral. Yuri, the podium is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Maron. Let me just start sharing this thing. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, can you see the first slide? Yes. Good. Uh, so, today I'm going to talk about the uh, new pathway, which hasn't been approved yet by CCG, but hopefully it will be in the future. That's something which the a GP or non-medical referral should be aware. And this is uh, uh, regarding the spinal radiogram. How we're going to vet and if we're going to accept and what we're going to recommend. So for, uh, just a bit of background. 
So in the past, as you know, that uh, the diagnosis was reached by medics predominantly based on the clinical examinations, including the history taking and, and examination itself. And the radiographs uh, or any imaging modalities were not the main tools which were utilized. However, uh, currently the clinical skills perhaps uh, not as robust as used to be. There is increased uh, workload, less time for patient, and uh, the radiology and imaging is at the forefront of um, diagnosis making or just in order to reach diagnosis. Uh, images are required in most cases. And uh, obviously, the, for the last couple of decades, the new modalities appeared uh, in Arsenal, including the CT, MRI, and PET scan, and so on. So, uh, another concept I would like to mention that spinal pain is not a non traumatic spinal pain, it's not uncommon. It's maybe everybody in their life will uh, complain of back pain. And not necessarily something to suggest is something malignant. So it's common complaint. The uh, but the radiographs, the X-rays in a primary setting, most cases are not contributory at all, as as a rule. Uh, and another uh, point that radiograph could delay the accurate diagnosis if it's not used appropriately, and it can give the false reassurance for the patients as well. So this is slightly been borrowed from the SAMS presentations. You can see that the radiographs are not, uh, not harmless. So for example, the X-ray of the spine will have the pattern of two or three months of background radiation. So it's something just to consider before ordering X-ray. You can discuss this with, with the patient as well, and particularly if it wouldn't bring any valuable information at all. So uh, we uh, recently reviewed our uh, guidelines, uh, the, the protocols, hospital uh, documents on vetting of spinal radiograph outside the hospital. And based on the Royal College of Radiology guidelines, we came up with um, this NUH protocol. This is based on the clinical situation. You could come across and again, and each modality which could be used, which one there will be the modality of choice. For instance, if you have a look at that, um, somebody presented with neck pain and there are some neurological deficit, you can see X-ray is not indicated at all, uh, particularly in the primary settings. The modality of choice will be MRI, maybe CT, if the patient is going to the surgical route and they want to know of the osseous structures. And uh, the same applies to the thoracic spine, for example, or lumbar spine, without trauma. And uh, so if there is some doubts, obviously uh, it needs to be just look at it. In each individual case, we could recommend X-ray, but in very rare cases. So to summarize, the X-ray spinal radiograph is indicated at GP or primary care setting only with somebody presenting with back pain and if the clinician suspects there is a vertebral fracture, most likely just fragility or supportic fracture, or if there is suspicious for seronegative spondyloarthropathy such as sacralitis, so it's still indicated. Otherwise, X-ray is not an appropriate test. So we go to the uh, this algorithm where the uh, uh, vetting clinician or the radiographer will be following the spinal pain, will certify it in the rare region if neck pain or lumbar thoracic pain. And again, if it's neck pain, it will be declined and MRI and with specialist referral will be suggested. If the uh, thoracic lumbar spine, again, if the QVD was supported fracture, yes, it will be accepted and vetted and performed. If there any other pain, particularly the red flag symptoms there or community malignancy that will be declined because it's not sensitive test. And with a request, obviously the MSK consultant and we'll have a look at each individual case. So another topic to mention about the log book pain and sciatic as well. Okay, so think about always about the 
alternative diagnosis. We are uh, losing you, Yuri. Somebody Yuri. who is not specific. Uh, Yuri, your microphone is going on and off. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, sort of better. Let's try again. No, still on and off. Hmm. Okay. okay, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Good. Okay, so just bring the microphone a bit closer. So, if, uh, according to the nice gardens, <coughs> Hmm. Still not very good. Certification Still a bit. Hello? Of, uh, still a bit of technical difficulty. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Maybe other people connected you to your Wi-Fi and slowing things down. Well, no, no, no. I'm just in. Hmm. Can you hear me now? Uh, a bit better. L let's try again. Just making sure the camera is off because you'll reduce the amount of upload. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, well, I nearly finished. I nearly finished. Hello? Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, that's better, yes. Uh, okay. Right. So this is a last slide as well. Just to mention that uh, very important to just to exclude red flag symptoms and ten, uh, the this was they are cancer, infection, trauma, inflammatory, spinal disease, spondyloarthritis. And if you suspect, in that case, MRI scan is indicated not routine, not routinely. Okay, so that's just to summarize it. MRI scan for spine is indicated only when there is authentic diagnosis or if in a specialist setting, uh, such as musculoskeletal interface clinic, and the patient is going to the surgical route, that uh, will be indicated as well. Otherwise, it's not going to change management in most cases. Do you have any questions? Any question for Yuri? OK, four minutes ahead of schedule. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating to this MSK pathway and safety training. This has hopefully increased the compliance uh, 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 to our new reporting convention and has unlocked the referring rights for many of our referrers. The entire training has been recorded for future reference and for anyone who has not been able to attend. Now, please fill in your evaluation form. This will be sent uh, to each of you by some. And once we receive your evaluation form, uh, you will receive your well-deserved certificate. Hope you enjoyed uh, this half-day training. And uh, if there are no other questions, have a lovely rest of the day, everyone. Yes, uh, uh, the recording can be sent to you. Let me stop recording first.